There's this generation that's coming up now where they are smart. They can use social media, YouTube for good, where they can learn really quickly about something and then feel empowered and really, they're not gonna take no for an answer. I know my son is that way, right? This is a problem, we have to solve it. You made the problem, he'll say those things to me without me putting those in his ear. So I'm hopeful for the next generation of rebels that are coming up, quite frankly, that are gonna be armed with knowledge and moving even faster than we are. The climate conversation has never been more divided. As disruptors in this space, we're hungry to find solutions to the challenges our environment faces. Welcome to the Climate Rebels Podcast. My name is Joel Caesar. I'm joined by Owen Barrett and Chris Pomerleau. We are experts in clean energy, net zero real estate, decarbonization, and entrepreneurship. We celebrate those who take action against the climate crisis and are striving to make the world a cleaner place. Thanks for joining the conversation. Now, let's get to work. Welcome to the Climate Rebels Podcast. Joining me as always is the real estate oracle of Omaha, Chris Pomerleau, self-proclaimed Adam Newman of Green Building, Owen Barrett, of course, myself, Joel Caesar, the world's greatest climate podcast host. Today's guest is Stacey Smedley. She's the multifaceted executive director of Building Transparency. As I introduced her earlier in the show, she's a legend in Green Building, someone who as we try to celebrate on the show, just goes and takes action, described herself as an impact junkie. I think we all really resonated with her origin story of how she got into what she does. What do you guys think? I love the origin story. I think it's one of the more heartfelt stories we've heard on the pod. A great beginning to a, a movie. Yeah. Kind of set set in motion the reason that she does what she does, which is great to hear. Yeah. So. Yeah. Really grabbed our attention and I hope it does with the audience. So, Before we get to that, we want to address greenwashing. So, new segment here for us in the Climate Rebels podcast. What is greenwashing? Owen Barrett, why don't you tell us? How long do we have? I I would say greenwashing is just being inauthentic. It's saying marketing, you're doing one thing and not actually following up those promises, those commitments with action. Pretty good. Which companies are doing it? Give us an example. Well, I think there's a lot of companies doing it. I think the four that I'd like to call out are the bigger oil companies out there, specifically Exxon, Shell, Chevron, and BP. In 2022, 60% of all of their public marketing were pieces that were pro-environment that would make people think that they're doing everything humanly possible to fight climate change. However, when you dig into the numbers, only 17% of the company's investments were actually in renewable energy. So I would call that greenwashing as the majority of their marketing is saying they're doing one thing. But when you look at how they're actually spending their dollars, it's doing something totally different. And so what's the risk out here in greenwashing? If we have big companies with huge marketing budgets and the ability to frame their message as they always have to the wider general public who don't have much time to dig into issues, then we'll be convincing people that things are fine or the big companies that are major offenders for environmental crises are actually somehow companies they should support. But it's challenging, right? I think we can all agree. How is anyone, how are we all supposed to wade through what's real and what's not? I think we heard some of that today, like this future planning of some type of report card or some type of metric to measure things that we look at. And and the fact that these are being developed, I know it wasn't necessarily on point to what we discussed, but that'd be great for the novice or someone just looking at this to get an idea of how close people are to actually implementing these opportunities. And I think that would help somebody like me, no question. I mean, yeah, I think, Joel, you're spot on. I think we're encouraging people to vote with their dollars, to, you know, use your power as a consumer to drive change. But if companies are just out there spewing bullshit about what they're actually doing, then it's hard as a consumer to vote with your dollars. So I don't know, maybe like Chris said, some kind of report card, something. There's got to be some easier way to really understand what companies are legitimate and what companies are just marketing. Yeah, I think it's a great point for this episode because Stacey's whole mission now with building transparency, like the name itself, they're trying to bring transparency to the building materials that go into the buildings that we occupy. I think we can all agree as consumers, as occupants, as builders, as designers, that makes a lot of sense. Crazy it took so long. But yeah, we're going to need that kind of nutrition label, I think is the analogy she used on all products mm-hmm. so consumers can be better informed. Yeah. Before we, we move on here, Chris, we talked about this a little bit before the episode. Someone alleged maybe that our which we would argue very purpose-driven business model, is somehow greenwashing? Here we go. Well, to this individual who will most certainly listen to this episode, it was coming from a position of trying to help us out because they feared that what we are doing could be viewed as such. So this friend of mine does not feel this way. But the greenwashing aspect of us installing solar on all of our roofs, which is so obviously important, they had mentioned that some people in this sphere could view as greenwashing. 
We would obviously argue against that. I'm sure you two have something special to say right now, but I'm not surprised. I, I don't think this would be the last person that might allege that. And I think when we heard his Owen's first question was, what are they doing? Right. So I'm surprised. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Are you like, you can't well, be serious. It's, it, it's like, Owen, you and I, we talked to like, there's realms in the spectrum of expertise in green building. There's like the person who says, if I put solar on my building, that's good. And then there's like where you and I went to grad school with Rocky Mountain Institute level, we're not doing deep green retrofits, then you're not doing enough. So there yeah. might be people who say, yeah, if you're putting solar on, but you're not doing X, Y, Z, everything else under the sun to make the building environmentally and socially more responsible, then you're greenwashing. So I think we should be prepared. I've got two counter arguments to that. I mean, I would put those sustainability nerds in the same camp as science deniers in terms of preventing actual progress. You can deny the science and say, we're not going to do this because there's no real problem. You can also say, we're not going to do this because it's not a perfect solution. So instead of doing something that's good, we're just not going to do anything at all. Both of those prevent progress. And then the other thing that I would tell this, you know, supposed sustainability <laughs> savant is give me some money at 4% interest and I can implement the perfect solution. But until you're willing to write a billion dollar check with a 4% interest, shut up. It's really that simple. I just got to say one other thing. One of my favorite podcast hosts, Chamath Palihapitiya, apologies if I butchered the name. I think that was good. He calls his audience it. idiots all the time. And this particular hypothetical audience member is an idiot. It's not greenwashing. It's doing more than any other real estate is currently. For the record, it was in defense of us being prepared for the onslaught of idiots. Yeah, that's no, what I, it was for. That's what I'm saying. That's a good warning. You'll get more of this, especially from sustainability nerds. So I think what Owen said was well said. I don't know if you put them in the same bucket as climate deniers, but... And I just lost a friend. I really appreciate that. Well, that's greenwashing. We'll continue to do our part to make sure we're not part of the problem. Now, here's our conversation with Stacey Smedley. Stacey Smedley is the executive director of Building Transparency, a nonprofit organization that is focused on making information and tools easily available to help the building industry quickly and effectively address the impact of embodied carbon's role on climate change. She's focused on the development and refinement of the resources, education, and technological advancements needed to drive decarbonization strategies and investment in green procurement. Stacy is a, a hero of mine in green building. She's a true legend in this field. We're about to be really amazed by her wealth of knowledge on embodied carbon, a topic we're going to dive deep into. And I think anyone who knows her and knows this field, she's as important as anyone in the country leading this charge. So we're super excited to have you joining us in the Collaborate Rebels podcast. Stacey Smedley, welcome. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you. You too. Well, we like to start every show with the same question. We get right to work. Stacey, how are you a climate rebel? Oh, man. I could answer this question a few different ways, but I, I guess I think my climate rebelliousness, <laughs> is that a word, stems from what I would call myself, I'm an impact junkie. I, I always need to be working on something that's hopefully creating positive impact. And it starts around climate based on me experiencing what it was like to have, you know, nature taken away from me when I was a kid. So I think I've got this innate need to kind of prove to my eight-year-old self that I can help her solve that problem for others and not have to go through that loss of nature and this kind of wake up to the climate problem through the lens of making positive impact. Well, very interesting answer. I, there's so much for us to discuss here on our agenda, but can we learn more about nature being taken away from you as a young person? Yeah, absolutely. A whole bunch of things happened all at once when I was eight. So my grandpa had purchased about 10 acres or so in, in rural Clackamas, Oregon when I was, before I was born and built a house that was basically my grandparents on the top level and my mom and I on the bottom level. She was she was a single mom. She used a sperm donor to have me, which is a whole other aspect of things, but um, she was going to raise me as a single mom. So he built us this house on this rural plot of land on this hill. We were on the downstairs level where I just opened the screen door and I'd walk out into this forest where we had all sorts of deer and blackberry bushes and trees that I called my big sky trees because I could just look up and just see their green leaves. And when I was around eight, I think it was eight, my grandpa came and just said, you know, he was getting older, he couldn't maintain the land anymore. And he sold all the land and kept the house to a, to a housing developer. It's right in the suburban Oregon on the edge of Portland. And uh, so we were in the house as they came and they actually clear cut all those acres of land that had been my natural playground. I thought it was normal for every kid to have that. I didn't understand why it was being just completely wiped away from me. I, you know, I got really angry and I told my mom I was going to grow up and figure out a way to build buildings and, and design things that didn't destroy nature. 
So that is very core in my being. At the same time, I was learning about Julia Morgan, who was the first female architect who did all sorts of things first. And I was like, I could be first in some of these ways too, maybe to help help how we design and build things. So more kids and more people don't have to experience that themselves. Stacey, awesome. thanks for uh, sharing that with us. That That's certainly the most heart-wrenching start to the show we've ever had. <laughs> Stacey, have you ever read a book called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louf? No, but maybe I should. I feel like I was the last child. Yeah. So he's got this whole, I mean, I don't really think it's a theory, but his whole idea is people protect what they love. And because kids aren't spending time outside anymore, they're all inside on screens. You're sort of losing this generation of people that feel commitment to protecting the outdoors. So his whole push is to get kids to spend more time outside, get schools to, you know, go back outside, have outdoor play, things like that. But sounds like you are trying to protect what you love. I think I am every day, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too, Stacey, I think you might be our eighth or ninth guest here. As we teed up the conversation to you, we informed you, we try to keep it positive. We try to talk about solutions. We try to talk about people that are disrupting, not like the doomsday, the climate's screwed and we're all effed. But you bring up anger. It's the first time I've heard someone talk about that as a driver. And obviously, that's a powerful motivator. Especially when you're eight and you really haven't experienced that before. I think there was just this like fire in me. I'm like, I've got to do something about this. So I think it's okay to have doomsday and anger as long as you turn that into something positive where you're going to actually act on it in a positive way. And that's really what I think I'm trying to do. Um, I think that's what eight-year-old Stacy was really saying in that moment. Like, I'm going to find a way to not have this happen again. But yeah, we can get more positive. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, I was going to say, that's that's a good segue. Let's talk about what you're doing, which is a lot of things. So where do you want to jump off? Maybe we dive right into your current role as the executive director of the Building Transparency Organization. I'll let you take it from there. What is it? What's your role? What are you most focused on right now? Sure. Yeah. So Building Transparency is a nonprofit. We've been around for a little over three years now. We're a COVID nonprofit where we you know started up right when COVID was hitting. So that's been interesting within itself. But our whole mission is to provide the free tools and data necessary to actually reduce embodied carbon emissions of the construction sector. So, you know, we focus on things like open data to help folks understand embodied carbon emissions, other impacts of materials, and the tools on top of that that can really catalyze everyone to be able to act. We started really to become the home for the embodied carbon and construction calculator or the EC3 tool which is a free tool that uses carbon intensity values out of third-party verified environmental product declarations. There's a ton of acronyms in all this work, so I try to at least say the full name the first time. So EPDs, and the, the tool really started with me at Skanska in my role prior to BT, where I was a sustainability director trying to figure out a way to find embodied carbon emissions data and use it to decarbonize things like concrete and steel. I couldn't find anything that was easy to use or really accessible, so EC3 was a, a conception of, of that tool. And so once Skanska Seed funded it as a free open tool, um, it was incubated at the Carbon Leadership Forum and then BT started up to really continue its development. So Stacey, let's, if we can, let's take a quick pause to educate the audience a little bit. Um, sure. Embody Carbon. What yep. is it? Why is it important? Why did you choose that path out of all the different ways we could try to decarbonize and focus our attention on this on the climate crisis? Sure. Yeah. So Embody Carbon is really the... The emissions it takes to extract, manufacture, transport, install, replace, and then dispose of building materials. It can be larger than building materials. Really, there's that same set of emissions for any product that we make. But in the construction sector, it's building materials. How do we extract the aggregates and the the lime to make cement and concrete? How do we actually make steel in a blast furnace or an electric arc furnace? What are the emissions of transporting those materials around and trucks and equipment and installing them? And the reason they're important, there's two reasons really for me. The first is that the scope of those emissions, when you think about global CO2 emissions, right now is is thought to be around 11% of total global emissions. We're not just talking about material manufacturing emissions, but all of the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, at least 11% are from the manufacture of building materials. So it's enough of a chunk of the pie that we need to address it. And it's also a chunk of the pie that we haven't been thinking about, maybe except for the last five years, seriously, maybe 10 years, just trying to figure it out. The other part is that uh, these emissions aren't like operational energy emissions. When you think about, you know, a building is built, you turn on the lights, you turn on the heating system, and then it's, it's consuming energy over the life of that building. There's emissions year on year associated with that. With embodied carbon emissions, the the major manufacturing process emissions, once you spin them to make the thing, you can't go and take it back and say, oops, now I'm going to change out my product. Those emissions are spent at the time of that manufacturing process. So that means you have to have the data and make the decision right now when you're designing and specifying procuring these things. 
So there's a, a huge need to get caught up um, on our education and our ability to actually address these emissions right now. I'm sure this is going to, you're going to have a different answer by asset class, but are emissions higher for the embodied side or the operational side? If you look at the life of a building, do you know? It's actually less dependent on asset class and more on the energy efficiency and the, the grid that energy is being pulled from. So in some markets like Seattle, whether it's a residential home, a mixed use building or an office building, because we have a hydroelectric grid and really stringent code. If you do that modeling embodied versus operational, 80 to 90% of the emissions are on the embodied side. Oh, if I wow. moved that same house to Florida or somewhere else where emissions might be dirtier when it comes to energy use and codes aren't as stringent right now for buildings, it might be 50-50. It might be swung a little bit towards the operational side. But there's stats out there that on average globally, it's really 50-50 if you try to look at just you know where are we broadly mm. across all building types. That's interesting. And I think it's fair to say we'll be optimistic here that the operational side of emissions we're getting really good at. We're getting good at building new construction, net zero energy and super efficient with on-site renewables. And there's lots of activity around grids, even in places you wouldn't expect. So as we clean up the operational side, then you're left with a very big problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, that's right. And I think, again, the really nuanced difference between these two scopes of emissions is you can build a pretty inefficient building uh, and know that you can retrofit those systems and make it more efficient over its life. You, you know the grid's going to decarbonize. There's going to be more of these projects where you can purchase renewable energy or, or be sourcing from a renewable type of energy. But again, on the embodied side, once you build that building out of your concrete or your steel or your, whatever your hybrid structure is and you put in the glass, those emissions, again, are spent. So it's just a different a different process. And there's an urgency in that kind of first decision that you make when you're designing a building when it comes to embodied carbon. Well, you teed us up well. Our company, the three of us, one of the main reasons we're doing this podcast is we're launching a company that uh, purchases existing buildings and does exactly what we described. We take underperforming dirty grid assets and we're converting them into net zero. So we wouldn't say that's easy. There's a lot going into it. But to your point, doable, right? Here, we're a business model doing exactly that. We can't go back and reduce the carbon footprint of the concrete or the steel that was used in those buildings even after we purchased them. But on that note, actually, I want to read back to Skanska, EC3, you being at this huge construction management company, which I know well, Stacy and I were colleagues at Skanska together. And you saying to yourself, I'm working on something. I know this is important. I work at this fantastic, huge company that's incredible, can do whatever it puts its mind to, but I don't have this data I need. So you said, screw it, I'm going to solve my own problem. So I guess... Going back to like this question of rebelliousness and who you are, Stacey, you said at the beginning, you're an impact junkie. So maybe talk a little bit about that time when you were at Skanska, had a really big, important job at a really big, important company, but you, it wasn't enough for you. You had to do something else. How do you manage wearing these hats? And I guess, is it, is it come back to this idea that you just got to have impact if it's there for the taking? Yeah. I mean, I think there was a key moment when I kind of daylit this issue where I mean, the data was out there. These, these environmental product declarations with these carbon intensity values of products were out there on the internet, you know, on PDF documents, at manufacturer websites. I could go find the data I needed um, one at a time and then take that carbon intensity value out of the little environmental nu nutrition label that lives in these documents. It's kind of like, you know, carb per serving size. It's kilogram of CO2 per unit of material. I found that little nugget and then I'd have to go put it in a spreadsheet and do that over and over again. So it's very obvious to me there was this this disruption that needed to happen to really digitize and automate all this. And the thing I had to think through is I, I could solve this for myself and for Skanska, or we could solve this for everyone. It's not just Stacy at Skanska that would benefit from having this data. And that's where the impact junkie thing, I think, comes in, that, that need to think beyond just what I need to do what I think is right and going to help the climate. But how do we take the needs of everyone. And I had this moment of realization that if I was going to have an opportunity to solve this, I couldn't just solve it for myself. And Skanska supported that when I took them this little innovation grant document that said, I want to see if I can digitize this information into a free open tool. They said, go for it. And they really supported the whole, the whole trajectory of EC3 after that. Very cool. I have a question here. I'm wondering... Now that you know a little bit about kind of what we have going on, what are some of the lower hanging fruit 
for people in our position that are trying to decarbonize and kind of do what we can on pre-existing buildings? Because there's a lot of things that can happen when you're building, right, from scratch. But uh, we obviously have plans on what to implement. But I'm just curious from you, Stacey, what are some things you're seeing people in our space do that, to help decarbonize and make these existing structures clean? There's an interesting opportunity if, if we're thinking about the, the retrofit space, because I think we always start with, you know, where are the biggest interventions on the embodied carbon front? And the first thing is don't build at all. So go into retrofit and, and actually account for how much emissions you're not spending by tearing that building down and building a new one. So there's an opportunity for you all to be able to tell that story. So core to our Just, business model is an embodied carbon story. Yeah. So it's it's absolutely like by by helping folks retrofit buildings and make them efficient and make them use, usable, you are saving all of those emissions we would have spent demolishing that building and building a whole new one. Hmm. So you should you should definitely tell that story. I mean, this is what if we could just not build anything new, we'd solve the majority of the embodied carbon problem. And then beyond that, you know, I think for for retrofits, there is this balance. You know, you need the data so you can do the do the analysis. But if you are going to look at making a building more efficient, you might be looking at more glazing or insulation and other things that do have an embodied carbon impact. So at least you can have the data now that it's there to to be able to look at the trade offs between operational improvements and embodied carbon emissions of those things that you need to improve. So just having that, I think, as part of what you're doing and part of the process will be valuable. Well, it's probably a good educational moment right there, Stacey. So if you were talking just in general, not retrofit versus new, but building industry that you're focused on, highest carbon intensity, concrete's one, steel's two, Glass three, timber three. You're, you're doing, you're doing well, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. They, this is my day job. I'm supposed to know this. You these up before it started. They're just kind of cheating, I think. <laughs> yeah. So c- cement is by itself somewhere around eight percent of global CO2 emissions. Just so if you think about that, I mean, definitely cement. It's the main input to concrete. So we buy concrete, and that's what we pour for for buildings and foundations and infrastructure projects. So definitely concrete. Steel is next. You know, there's the two types of steel, whether it's a blast furnace or an electric arc furnace, and really the, the process emissions of, of those. And then there's other really process-heavy materials. So if you think about it that way, the things that take a lot of energy or have emissions that come off of just the process, so glass would be on that list. Other types of metals, you know, aluminum. Mm-hmm. And then you're getting into just, after that, it gets into what you use a lot of. So on like a, a finish or envelope insulation, there are blowing agents and in some of the insulation that push them way up. And then, you know, if you think about major things, when you look around, even my house, you know, gypsum board, carpet, that's more about the quantity times the emissions factor than that initial emissions factor. But you also have to think about that too. So that's why when you answered Chris's question about retrofit, so we're buying existing multifamily and our business model is primarily focused around decarbonization, but there are other improvements we make to the properties and to the units. So I think what you said, glass, you said drywall, you said carpet. I mean, I think, Chris, these are probably all things that are on your item itemized list when you do a value add, right? Oh, for sure. Most definitely. And the cool thing is that for, I mean, what I, I loved the discovery of having the data and having a tool that allowed, you know, first kind of our core pilot users and now a whole bunch of people just look at products that already exist is that low-hanging fruit, you can see swings of up to 30, 50% emissions differences between available products within a category, things like carpet, even optimized concrete mixes. So as you're specifying those products, it may be a very easy decision to look at, you know, three carpets and know that this one's 30% less than the next one. They're comparable in performance, they're comparable in cost because they've been competing already. So it's just another data point to have in that decision. So Stacy, I was talking to Joel this weekend about having you as a guest and it kind of dawned on me that of the 10 years that I've spent in sustainability, they've all been on the operational side. Like I've never in my career focused on embodied carbon, which I thought was interesting. But so it sounds like the onus is on developers more or less to tackle the embodied carbon problem. Is that an accurate statement? And then I kind of have a follow-up question. It's not. (laughs) It's not. (laughs) So who is so- It's everyone. So- if you think about that, the stick is really the owner, right? The one that's building the building that owns the the ability to say, just brass tacks, we're gonna we're gonna account for body carbon. Team, you must you must do this, but that's not gonna be good enough. We're not gonna get every developer owner to do that in the time that we have to really fix this. 
So what I love about what we've been able to do with what Building Transparency offers through EC3 and now some other other things like our Tallycat free plugin to Revit is really take away all the barriers for a designer or an engineer or a contractor to go in and be like, I'm going to just make that choice without needing the developer or owner to tell me I should. So there's responsibility across really the whole value chain of, of ownership, design, construction, even operation maintenance to be tackling this all at once because that's the only way we're going to get there or have a chance of getting you know to the decarbonization we need in time yeah. even manufacturers yeah. they're, they're using the tool too to go actually compare themselves and say okay well i'm 20 percent higher than my competitor i should go have a conversation to see how we can reduce the emissions of our products so we need all of that to be happening at once that makes sense i guess maybe i didn't phrase a question right us as a group that buys existing buildings Joel mentioned to me that sort of the embodied carbon is not our responsibility if we purchase a building that someone else built. Is that right? Someday when everyone's accounting for the embodied carbon of the project they are building and then selling, that should be something that you actually consider when you're purchasing. Like that's what I was getting at. Like how how far was that developer in the first place? Yeah. How far away are we from having like a scorecard when we buy a building? That we, if we're looking at two identical buildings, 200 unit apartment buildings, we could see the embodied carbon as the buyer of both and make decisions that way. Is, do you think that's like a reality in the future? I, I do. I mean, we're working on a, a project right now. We're just in the early stages with the Architecture 2030, Carbon Leadership Forum, Living Future Institute, USGBC, and then all the different reporting commitments that are out there for architects, structural engineers to try to align around one common format and reporting framework where we could put it in EC3, but we could also publish it, where every building is basically reporting on this stuff in a way that's standardized. So you could get to a, you know, apples to apples comparison of carbon intensity per square foot. That's really the metric. It's very much like yeah. energy use intensity, where you can build it up for a certain scope of materials and then get that carbon carbon content for the building. It's almost like an EPD for a building, where it's a nutrition label giving you that that carbon data. That'd be yeah. great. It would be, yeah. yeah, it would be fascinating as buyers if there was an ability to do that. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we'll get there. We already have, I think, 2,500 projects in EC3 and an ability for them to publish them anonymously so we can start to get our own benchmarking database out there, which is another important thing. We need to understand kind of really where we are right now with different building types. Let's transition actually into all the work you just mentioned. We mentioned before the show about you've been traveling to DC. You're doing a lot of advocacy work. You're talking to policymakers. You're aligning with other groups in the world of carbon embodied carbon to try to align on consistent methodology. So maybe you can talk about why that's so important. It's probably related to this, everything getting more publicized around carbon disclosure and using the same format so that we can all be measuring ourselves the same way, but love to hear it from your voice. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, really, that's really the end goal, right? I mean, I think companies like Google, some of our partners, which include Google, but also Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera, are wanting to report these scope three supply chain emissions where embodied carbon emissions live. They're saying that you're going to get to zero by a certain day, including these emissions. And unless everyone's kind of accounting for that the same way, the, the data is really garbage in, garbage out. You, don't, you can do it within your own methodology, within your own company. But there's no assurance that it, it means anything compared to, you know, a competitor or, or a peer. So, you know, we, we worked on a project to try to get to, you know, as built realized accounting for scope three emissions using quantity times carbon value and all these things. We're trying to get the scope of what's included aligned. And I think I'm also trying to learn learn from the lessons I, I had in the toxicity space because the simpler we can make this for the industry, the less noise there is and the more action happens versus competition between different types of disclosure or different types of methodology. So we're at an interesting moment because embodied carbon was so kind of new. No one was really thinking about it holistically. And all these folks have been through the lessons of other things like materials ingredients, where I think there's a, a, a desire and I think a, a knowledge that if we don't align, we're not gonna do this fast enough. So we're working across all those fronts. On the policy front, it's the same thing. I think I always say we have private policy and public policy. So we have the private owners who can put out what they're going to do first without having to go through the politics of of everything that happens in the public sector to get things passed. And in embodied carbon that happened, private companies set some policy. Then the public sector started pushing out things called policy called buy clean in a couple of markets. And then the White House picked this up. Then the Inflation Reduction Act has funding in it for embodied carbon accounting and they're pointing back to what the private sector did and engaging really really the group of experts including bt to help them make sure they don't do something completely different 
you know, it, we, we, we can't have federal government, state government and private sector all, all requiring similar but not the same things because that again the confusion it's into the market is just something we can't we can't do so can't afford, we're yeah. engaged in a lot of those conversations across private state federal policy to really try to be the connective tissue to align this stuff very cool well let's actually transition to your social media influencer game this group you know we're all now adjusting evolving into trying to be more active on social media because our whole company is about bringing eyes to raise money and crowdfund a real estate fund. But I think there's, I told these guys before the call, I I want us to learn from you. And I'd love to hear your mindset going into it. I I would say, well, you can tell us better than I I would. But a couple of years ago, maybe pandemic, you started posting every day, I think on Embodied Carbon. And it was just this LinkedIn. It was part of my experience. I like, there's Stacy again with some dropping some knowledge bomb about Embodied Carbon every single day. So maybe tell us, why'd you do that? And how has it worked and how has it changed your brand and career? I've I've always appreciated LinkedIn because of the kind of professional community it's built. You know, I think when the pandemic hit, I had a couple thousand followers and I wasn't even really looking at it through that lens of followers, but I needed a place to really post about how I was feeling. And I thought if I made myself post every day, um, and it was on climate the first year, it was 365 days of climate posts. So it wasn't always embodied carbon, but since I knew that, it was a lot of it. But it was a way for me to actually go learn and then share what I was learning. So more than just me regurgitating stuff I knew, it, it made me go try to find new articles and new data points and new sources of information. Um, so I was making myself smarter. And really, it was the impetus that I had to share something that kept me on my on my game. It kept me accountable to go continue to do that. I had no idea it was going to get me more followers. That was not even, I, you know, it just started happening. <laughs> It's still happening. I did the second year was positive posts. I think the third year was me posts. And this year is supposed to be supply chain posts. I will say I've fallen off the wagon a little bit this year. But I still post whatever day it is when I when I find something good. I say it's this day and here's what I'm here's what I'm thinking. So I confess it hasn't been every day this year. I think it's just sharing knowledge and then letting that be a, a catalyst for you to gain more knowledge too, because you are then expected to share. So it was it was worthwhile for me and it still is. We don't have too much time left, but while we're here, you wear multiple hats. You write music. I think there's children's books. Maybe I don't know as much about as I should. You want to highlight some of your other hats you're wearing here? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, every day building transparency, just trying to get, get more adoption. I want to say two things about where we are with, with BT and EC3 just because I'm proud of it and then I'll move on to the other things. But, you know, we're at, at 35,000 users in 70 countries you know, thousands of people are going in the tool every day and using it to find products. So I'm really proud of that. And we want it to continue just to go up. But beyond that, I have a website called Climate Everything, where I've made a whole bunch of climate related GIFs and infographics that are available for anybody to go grab. There's one on supply chain emissions, there's one on, you know, c- c- carbon emissions of concrete, and a couple that have been picked up by folks to use and like publications and stuff. But there's just a bunch of nerdy infographics that I would love more people to go look at food and emissions, all sorts of things. And I'm in a band called Magnolia Steel Band. I write the music and play the guitar and sing. And we do have two climate songs. So Grave Diggers and Swan Song that I wrote about climate that are my favorites. And we actually are albums on iTunes and all the things. So you can go find the songs. That's we'll great. have to check that out. Yeah. And then children books, I've, ri- I've written them. I was going to self-publish them. It takes time and they're just kind of there, Joel. So hopefully one day those will get out there into the world. But I wrote one about living buildings and about bee pollination and all sorts of other things. <laughs> Talk yeah. to us when that's available because we could maybe do something where we send that to some of our investors or whomever's an affiliate with us. That could be a cool little gift. Excellent. Yeah, we can work on that now. I'll put it back on the on the short list of things. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of time. <laughs> the stats about building transparency and the growth in just a few years, something that started as a pandemic effort. Really impressive, Stacy. So congratulations on all the success you've achieved so far. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's more to do. More to do. Well, we are probably out of time. We talked about a lot of positivity here. And, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier in the show, we try not to harp on the negative news about climate and the environment here. So let's try to finish it on a, a ray of hope. Stacey, what, what gives you hope for the future? I would say a couple of things. I mean, I, first, I think we finally turned the corner on on climate awareness in a way that has surprised me in terms of who's now focusing on it, where climate's coming up in terms of a topic where it wasn't on the news, even maybe five years ago, as much as it is today. So, so I we, see the right trajectory. You say we meaning 
The world, you think? The world. Yeah. So that's positive. And then I also just, my son's 11. I have hope because there's this generation of that's, that's coming up now where they are smart. They, you can use the, all of the social media, you know, YouTube stuff for good, where they can learn really quickly about something and then feel empowered. And really, I would say, like, they're not going to take no for an answer. I know my son is, is that way, right? This is a problem. We have to solve it. You made the problem. Like, he'll say those things to me without me putting those in his ear. So I'm hopeful for this generation of kind of the next generation of rebels that are coming up, quite frankly, that are going to be armed with knowledge and actually experiencing some of this stuff to move even faster than we are. So, Well, you and your work on LinkedIn, and we might have to convince you to start a Building Transparency TikTok channel. Owen will tell you all about his love of engaging climate deniers on TikTok. Oh, there's a lot of them. Actually, that's a good question. Do you get a lot of climate denial on LinkedIn? Or is it... Every once in a while. But not, uh, not a ton. Not a ton. Yeah. They're all hanging out on TikTok, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, means that is where I need to go if I actually want to make more impact is to, to hit the folks that, that need the messaging more. Well, Stacy, we'll wrap it up there, but we want to make sure our audience knows where to find you, knows how to access all the great things you shared today. So what's the best way? Follow you on LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, so LinkedIn, we've got, you can follow me. Building Transparency has a good page too, where we post a lot of uh, really embodied carbon wonky, you know, specific topics and, and things that we're working on or others are working on. And then buildingtransparency.org. If you want to get into EC3 for free, you can go there and register and, and learn all about what we're doing as a nonprofit. Very cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining. You can find us on most of the social media platforms at Join Raven. So that's Join and Raven is with a Y, R-A-Y-V-E-N. You can find this podcast and more great content at joinraven.com. If you like the podcast, please subscribe, like, and share with your friends. And until next time, we encourage you to ask yourself, what are you doing to fight the climate crisis?